and welcome everybody once again to our Meet the Candidates series in partnership with Serbian Radio Chicago. Serbian American Voters Alliance is bringing to you an amazing list of candidates that are going to be either running in 2022 or some of the political operatives and prominent people in our political landscape. So I am so happy to bring on a great friend, might I say now, Kimberly Klasik, who became such a great Liberty firebrand and a conservative firebrand. She is joining us today. She was running in 2020 as a uh, congressional candidate out of Maryland. So she will tell us about her great run and about the viral ad that she had out of Baltimore. Kim, welcome back and great to see you again. Hey Olga, good to see you too. Thanks for having me, I really appreciate it. Um, this is so, an honor. Yes, and it's an honor to have you. We, we hosted you here in Naples with General Mike Flynn and Dr. Linda Lee Tarver. We're gonna do something again together, but you're really busy, you're traveling the country. But I want to go back to 2020 and this amazing viral ad that you had and you became overnight a national conservative star. So I am going to share the ad and tell me a little bit about it. Yeah, so, you know, we dropped that ad in about August of 2020. And for us, you know, it was kind of deep in the race, right? Because we only had until November 3rd to really convince Baltimoreans that we really cared about the city and the fact that they've been voting for Democrats for the past 50 years was just, you know, not in their best interest. And so we try to put all of that in a three minute ad. Uh, we were so lucky to be contacted by Benny Johnson. Uh, he's most notably with Turning Point, but he also has a media company called Arsenal Media. Uh, so they came up to Baltimore and we shot that video in about four hours uh, it might have been the hottest day of the year <laughs> that day. Uh, it was about 106 degrees, but we stayed out there um, and we felt like, you know what, we really got it right. Uh, we went back to editing uh, and they did a fantastic job with it. They did better than, than I could have imagined. And so when the video dropped, you know, I didn't think it was really this viral ad, you know, once I watched it after editing, but I didn't understand, I guess, you know, the magnitude at that time. So many people were just looking for the truth, you know, across the country. And so for us, we were just telling the truth about Baltimore, telling the truth about Democrats, and of course, telling the truth about this language that we hear so often. Uh, you know, we hear this uh, Black Lives Matter theme that's been going on throughout, I would say, probably a year and a half now. Um, but at the same time, there are a lot of Black lives being lost in cities like Baltimore. And I think a lot of it is due to the poor education system, uh, the lack of opportunities, and everything else we have going on that government could assist with fixing. So, you know, that was my whole basis is like, look, I'm running to finally get us out of this rut, you know, bringing manufacturing jobs back um, and then talking about the real things going on, not just the same old, same old, you know, we always hear these cliche lies, like I said, Black Lives Matter, or, you know, things that they kind of come up with along the way. And a lot of it has to do with racism, but really in cities like Baltimore, uh, you know, racism isn't our issue. You know, we've had nothing with black leaders the past 30 years. You know, our issues go deeper than that. And that's what we were trying to show. Excellent. And the ad instantly went viral. Now, from that point on, you were such a great conservative star in, in and you kind of led this conservative movement. I have to ask you just traditionally, what is it that consistently keeps tying the Black community to the Democrat Party? And why is that identity politics so important for them? And anytime somebody steps outside that predetermined boundary, um, they are called all kinds of names and they are not accepted. They're not being tolerated. So, so why is that the case with the uh, black community traditionally that in fact comes from a lot of the conservative background? Yeah, absolutely. So like you said, you know, a lot of, um, especially the, the older generation uh, of black people grew up in the church. And so we are very conservative people. Um, you can, you know, point to anybody's grandmother and she will still tell you, 
you know, what to wear, what not to wear. You better be in church on Sunday morning and watch your manners. And, you know, but it's interesting because when you are a Republican, for some reason, you know, and I don't know if it's because of the media or where it's just pushed out, um, but then people automatically think racist or racism. And so they were, you know, the media on the, and the left was so great at tying Trump to this whole white supremacy and, and racist rhetoric. But at the same time, he was the only candidate really supporting uh, diverse candidates across the country. If you look at the candidates that he supported, like myself, uh, Burgess Owens, Anna Paulina, you know, there were so many people that he supported that were of all races. And so it didn't make any sense, but you know, they were, like I said, media and the left was really good at tying it together. Um, and for us, I think some people, you know, they grew up in times that was before the civil rights movement. And we can all agree at those times, you know, there was a lot of racism at that time. But as we made certain strides, um, I think at that point, Democrats realized the only way to keep hold of that voting block is to continue that same rhetoric as things aren't getting better, things are still racist. Um, and, and I even say, you know, if you voted for Joe Biden, you know, you, you got to make it make sense because this is a guy who was a senator voted for segregation and for busing, you know. And so now he's talking about uh, Jim Crow 2.0 and all these other things that have to do with racism when he was a guy that voted for and in favor of racist policies. Sure. And you are very outspoken critic, I have to say, of the current president. You've criticized him for lack of media appearances, for um, barely at all in the press. Um, but talk to me also about the vice president choice. And just as a woman and as a woman of color, uh, what is it that kind of predetermined Kamala Harris for this position versus a lot of different candidates that in fact have the quality and have the content. And especially as you said, on the conservative side, we have some wonderful people who actually even came out of this 2020 election. Yeah, yeah, so it's very interesting. And so, you know, as we all saw the presidential debates, uh, we saw the first presidential debate of 2020 uh, for the Democrats and you saw, you know, Kamala Harris basically telling Biden and telling the world exactly who he is and what he was, you know, as he was senator. And so for that, you know, after that, I don't think she made uh, some great, I guess, uh, traction with the rest of the, the country. Uh, she was polling at 1% at one point in time. Uh, and then she had to bow out like everyone else, you know, she ran out of money. And so for me, it was kind of like, all right, you know, America didn't choose Harris. And that happens, right? There's lots of candidates. Uh, but then when it came down to the fact that they clearly were pushing Joe Biden as a front runner, and when I say they, I mean the DNC and of course the mainstream media, uh, it then came apparent that to hide, I guess, some of the things that he did as a senator, like I said, voting in favor of segregation, he knew at that point in time, and there was a lot of pressure for him to pick a black woman as a VP. And I don't know if you remember that hashtag win with black women uh, was this huge thing for about a month. And I was like, um, hi, I'm black. Does that mean me too? And they're like, no, 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 not you, just Democrat black women. And so he picked a woman, uh, remember it came down to three choices. There was Karen Bass, uh, mm -hmm. Susan Rice, and then you know Kamala Harris. And so he chose Harris, which I thought was interesting because if you, you match up all of the women, uh, Susan Rice, who, who I don't agree with on anything, uh, she actually had more experiences and more qualification uh, to be in the White House, you know, Absolutely. Uh, but they, they chose Harris. And I thought that was interesting because, again, she was only polling at one percent when she dropped out of the race. Um, but it was always about color. Right. It was about color right. and gender. And so if we look at what's going on even in today's uh, society and what's going on in the news today, uh, you look at what happened in the uh, Minneapolis case that just happened on Sunday. Dante Wright. Uh, I mean, the, you know, a lot of people are upset and I, and I understand, you know, the female cop, uh, she accidentally says she accidentally tases or she went to go tase him and end up shooting him. But here's a case where what if this woman got this position because she's a woman, right? And that's how we're diversifying things, right? We're adding women, we're adding people of color because it's the right thing to do in society. So that's what I say, look at this situation. This woman obviously made a huge mistake. Perhaps she should have gone through some more training but the way that we treat our, our country today, we are actually hiring people based on gender and color. And so here we're in this, I said, you know, you gotta make it make sense. It doesn't match up. Either we want qualified individuals, we want trained police officers, we want those people that should really be in those positions, 
or do we want to cater to people for their gender or their race? You know, we've got to, you got to pick a side here. And, and so I'm hoping that more people will really see, you know, voting for someone based on their gender or race, which Martin Luther King Jr. was emphatically against, you know, we should be making sure that we stick to those things as far as our civil rights leaders, you know, they fought for us to be, you know, basically, uh, I guess, judged by our character and Absolutely. not our race or gender at all. Absolutely. And that is actually interesting. You you bring that up. I know you fly a lot, a lot around the country. And American Airlines, I think, just put out a statement where they also are saying that they are going to pick uh, people based on what you just said, identity yeah. um, and, and especially color. And you would hope that they would actually pick people who will land the plane safely um, right. rather than any other things. But so you've been proactive. You, you put out some great content on your social media. Um, talk to me, for example, about Cardi B. There was a little bit of a thing there where she doesn't get blocked on social media. However, one of our female uh, congressional representatives, Mar Marjorie Tyler Greene, she's been blocked on several occasions. So again, back to this identity, but very specific identity that we are looking for and the hypocrisy that is, of course, prevalent. And you were very outspoken about that situation. Yeah, absolutely. So like you said, it's very specific, right? You know, they're both women. And as far as the left is concerned, we should uplift both of them because they are women. But unfortunately for Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's a wonderful congresswoman, she is a conservative. And so because of that, you know, she is cancelable, right? Whereas Cardi B, who, you know, I, I have no qualms, I guess, with Cardi B. My daughter, you know, my daughter, four years old, she's not allowed to look at Cardi B or listen to her, right? I'm her mother. <laughs> and of so course. there's no Cardi B at our house. Uh, but at the same time, you know, here's a woman who actually interviewed Joe Biden. I don't know if you remember that as he was sure. running as a presidential candidate. Um, and so here, you know, what was her qualifications to even be doing that? Was it just to kind of get him in pop culture? I don't know. But the way that we're treating both women, you know, makes absolutely no sense. Here's a woman that's now in Congress that's representing constituents in Georgia. Uh, and then here's a woman that really doesn't represent much of the country at all. If you're, if you're looking at her entertainment value, I mean, I don't know many women that dress and, and act as Cardi B do. Um, but so it's like, why are we, you know, basically choosing one side over the other? And why would we choose the side in which, you know, again, they're not really representation of the country. And so now you see Marjorie Taylor Greene, unfortunately, uh, Twitter suspends her account all the time. Uh, she'll even say, sometimes they'll say it was an error, which we know right. it's not an error, right? You know, of course, they just want to silence her. Uh, but this is kind of where we are. And that's another big problem, uh, which is big tech. Uh, and so we're on a slippery, a slippery slope for sure. And big tech and the entire cancel culture where only, again, specific things are consistently getting canceled. And if you are canceled and you are not out on social media or in the mainstream media, typically yeah. you don't exist anymore. So the majority of the population essentially is being completely canceled out and blacked out. Now, talk to me back again uh, to 2020. You are in, of course, traditionally Democrat district. You were running for former Elijah Cummings, uh, who, who passed away, for, for his seat. So what happened in 2020, spe specifically in your district? Yeah, so Maryland's District 7 is a D plus 30 district. And, you know, for, for people, when you hear D plus, you know, whatever, just, you know, to kind of put it in perspective, for every... 30 Democrats, there's like one Republican, right? So it's it's a race that, you know, even the, the Maryland GOP said, Jesus Christ is a Republican, could not win that race. And so we knew going into it, it was nothing but an uphill battle. Uh, but for us, it was kind of like, you know, at what point in time do we start chipping away at some of these districts? You know, do we just allow them to deteriorate? And, you know, if you live in the state of Maryland, you best believe all of the tax dollars are going straight into Baltimore and the problems that you see there. So. We said, you know what, we're gonna run in Maryland District 7, it's tough, uh, but you know, like I said, when we made that viral campaign ad, again, it was a lot of people that came forward and said, this is the truth. Uh, and the interesting part about that is uh, in West Baltimore specifically, where we shot that ad, we actually flipped that part of the district. They voted for myself and President Trump. And so I was very happy, you know, our team did a lot of grassroots uh, efforts. We knocked on pretty much every door, you know, we had events every single day. Uh, my main team, which was about maybe five or six people, they never slept. 
you know, from August 20th until November 3rd, they didn't sleep. You know, we had people that never even went home. Um, and that's just how involved they were in this. Uh, and so we were so grateful for all the donors, um, all of those that supported us. You know, President Trump endorsed us, uh, Don Jr., Eric Trump, Lara Trump. You know, there were so many people that were just on our side uh, that was really just getting a lot of people to just look at our race. Um, and, and I think, you know, for some people were, were questioning, you know, where our viral ad was even taking place. They were like, wow, I can't believe that's even in America. You know, it looks like a third world country. And so you had a lot of people where it kind of opened their eyes and said, wow, is this how some people are living in our very country where, you know, this is a land of opportunity? Uh, so we received a lot of letters uh, with checks from like Oklahoma and Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And they would say, you know, Kim, I only have $50 to give. This is my last 50 bucks. But I just feel so bad for any of the children that are growing up in those conditions. And so with that, we were like, look, this is a fight. This is a huge fight. But we're not going to give up. We're not going to quit. Um, and then as you know, election day came down, polling said that we were neck and neck with our opponents, which was Kwaisi and Fume, former NAACP president, former congressman. He held that seat before Congressman Elijah Cummings. It was you know, definitely a tough opponent. But you know, he didn't really do any campaigning. Uh, he refused to debate us. He said that I wasn't a serious candidate, in his opinion. Uh, we went on to raise $8.4 million. He did not even hit the million dollar mark. So we were very excited about that. We thought, you know what, maybe we can outspend him with the mailers, you know, just doing everything that we can. Um, and then when it came down to election night, you know, things we thought were so close, you know, by the next morning. And as I don't know if you remember, you know, election night was just chaos for so many different states. Sure. Uh, but as the mail-in ballots started coming in, uh, we really lost by the mail-in ballot piece. And so this is Maryland, unsolicited mail-in ballots where we didn't verify any signatures. Um, I don't know if we had the Dominion Sheens or not, but uh, for us, the mail-in ballots is what hit us hard. Uh, and then of course we started receiving stories about, you know, ballot harvesting and, and so forth. And so you know, at that time, we, we tried to contact the RNC. They told us that they're really working on President Trump's case. And they said, and then this is, you know, something that anyone would agree with. You know, once we win President Trump's case, it'll all fall into place for candidates across the country. And so we were all just kind of watching and, and biting our nails. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I didn't feel the RNC worked as hard as they could. You know, it's my personal opinion for President Trump. Uh, but now, you know, like you said earlier, you know, we started our pack traveling the country because uh, we're not going to give up. Obviously, 2022 is, is right around the corner. And that's a great segue into what I wanted to talk to you about. So talk to me about Red Renaissance and what you're doing right now and what all of us, I guess, are doing looking towards that 2022. But given what you just said and given what we know about very serious voter fraud, and allegations, and of course, a lot of proof that came out, but nothing came out of it. Are we ready for 2022? And are people actually believing now our electoral process? What is it about voter integrity that we can ensure that these votes are going to count and that we're going to have an election day, only one day, and right. not so many weeks of the election? So what it is that um, we can all do and what is it that you're doing with Red Renaissance? Yeah, thank you, Olga. So, so for us, you know, when we look at the voter integrity piece, of course, that's huge, right? Um, we're told, again, by the RNC and, and by, like, the state local parties that they are working on it. You know, the, the best thing to do is obviously to go, like, uh, you know, to your local offices, calling your, your state senators, calling your governor's office. Um, but everybody wants in place basically what Governor Ron DeSantis did right there sure. for you in Florida, which is, you know, making sure unsolicited mail-in ballots are not sent out. You know, that is that is keen to fraud, right? Anybody okay. can pick up an unsolicited ballot and fill it out any way they please. And, and ballot harvesting usually happens in that case. So we are hoping that, you know, more states will crack down on that. Um, a lot of people are talking about the voting laws in Georgia that were just put in place. Honestly, well, all it does really is, is put voter integrity back into the process. You know, everyone's saying, oh, it's against black people. You know, black people have a hard time getting an ID. I, I am black Olga, and I don't know anybody that doesn't have an ID, okay? <laughs> and so that makes absolutely no sense. But what that does is help us prove whoever is voting is that actual person and that they are registered to vote. And so really at the end of the day, it protects not just you know the minority vote, but all votes. And so I don't know why more people don't want that. 
Um, yeah, so the RNC told us that they're working on it. Uh, we have our RNC chairwoman uh, here in Maryland. Her name is Nicole Ambrose. Apparently, she has a whole team that's descending on it. Uh, they're to, dealing with the Maryland Board State of Elections. And so hopefully we'll see something come out of that in the next couple of months. Uh, for us, Red Renaissance is something that we couldn't uh, delay on. Uh, you know, we had to really get out there. You know, we're supporting candidates right there in Florida. Uh, William Montague, I guess he's in uh, Florida's 10 Orlando. Sure. Carla Spalding, she's down there as well. Um, There's so many great candidates that within their communities, um, you know, they're, they're prominent people. And I mm -hmm. do believe that some of these candidates uh, can really get the, the vote for the GOP. And so for us, it was like, look, you know, we're not just supporting just minorities. You know, we're supporting people in their communities that can make a difference and that are true conservatives, right? And so we want people that are America first. Uh, we want people that support the Constitution. Of course, you know, who, you know, who I am, you know, we want people to be pro-Trump. Uh, and, and so we want people that are really going to stand by their values and their morals. You know, I love the Marjorie Taylor Greene type. Uh, a lot of people say, you know, she's so outspoken or she's so this and she's so that. Well, you know what, it's, what you, no one can say about Marjorie Taylor Greene is she stands her ground. She doesn't mm -hmm. back down from anyone. And so we need more people on Capitol Hill like that. Uh, watching Byron Donalds right there out of Naples, mm -hmm. he is doing a great job on Capitol Hill and he's not letting anybody push him around either. And so that's what we need. Um, so we're supporting people in Florida, uh, Georgia, Arizona. Tomorrow I go to Rhode Island. Um, or our friend know. Bob, sure. Yep. Bob, yep, yes, yes, he was there in Naples too. Yeah. Uh, and then Virginia, you know, we have some great people. Uh, there's a really great guy running for governor actually in New Jersey. New Jersey is very blue. So we're up there helping out. We'll be sending, hopefully he'll win his primary. We'll send our volunteers to New Jersey to help knock doors. You know, so we're, we're going to be really all around. Uh, I think I go to California in a couple of weeks, too. Uh, Major Williams, he's running for governor there. Uh, okay. We know Governor Gavin Newsom, definitely, since the recall didn't really happen, we got to get behind, uh, you know, a candidate out there as early as possible to sure. hopefully take Gavin Newsom out of office. So there's going to be a lot that we do uh, from now until 2022. But, you know, we only have five congressional seats to flip. Uh, as mm -hmm. far as the Senate, we're right there. Uh, and there are some Senate seats that we'll be, you know, turning over in 22 as well. So I just think, you know, what are the possibilities here that we could flip the House and the Senate by 22 and get back the White House in 24 and get back to some normalcy? Sure, very likely. And especially if we get through some of these voter laws and uh, voter ID and things like that. But uh, we may have our friend Rick Grinnell also run for governor of California. It's been rumored. I wanted to ask you about another candidate. And I know you were in Illinois right after our Naples event. Uh, Catalina Lauf. Now we're looking at some candidate, candidates who are also running against Republicans. So <laughs> this is just an interesting dynamic here where we're looking to get rid of, as they say, some of the rhinos. She's running against Adam Kinzinger, and I'm interested in Illinois, especially because Serbian Radio Chicago is based there, and we have a great number of Serbian Americans who live in Illinois. Talk to me about Catalina and her campaign. We would love to have her on. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, and whatever, I don't know if you're connected, but I'll definitely connect you to. Sure. Um, she's a great friend of mine. She's, you know, one of the young women that I met, uh, you know, while I was running my race. Uh, there was about maybe five or six of us women that kind of just clung together and was holding on for dear life going into, you know, November 2020. And, and Catalina is one of those women where she was on the ground every single day in Illinois. You know, she always were uploading her videos. They knocked doors every single morning. They were out there passing out their, their flyers and their literature. And, and so she didn't give up. Um, and so now, you know, with running against uh, Congressman Adam Kinsinger, obviously he was a thorn in, in President Trump's side for, for so long. Um, but here's a guy that loves going on CNN, loves going on MSNBC, and loves kind of just, you know, siding with the Democrats in spite of the Republicans because we are Trump supporters. And so it was interesting, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, he actually quote tweeted one of my tweets. Now, we've never spoke to each other at all, Representative Kingsinger and myself, but I know he knows now that I'm supporting Catalina Lau. Uh, so when I went up there with Scott Pressler and uh, Alex Berchowitz, uh, we were there and literally they told people in 48 hours that we were coming up. They had over 300 people show up uh, in support of Catalina. And a lot of the people said, you know what? We really need to get Kinzinger out of office. He does not represent this district whatsoever. Um, it's interesting to me, though, he's, he's raised a lot of money 
through the Lincoln Project uh, and through basically Democrats, right? So he's already at 1.1 million. Uh, we've been helping Catalina with fundraising, obviously doing rev share email lists and things like that. Uh, but I think what will really put her over the top is hopefully she'll finally get that endorsement from President Trump. Okay. Interesting. Now, I want to ask you about something that is really a pressing issue in the country currently, and President Trump had it all planned out. It stopped. You traveled to the border recently, and of course, you know, I come from that background of transnational crimes, including human trafficking. Yeah. There is a disaster happening at our border right now. Tell me about the experience of being at the border and what is it that we can do right now? Because clearly it seems like when we go back to talking about voter ID and election integrity, the people that are being just let into the country clearly are going to change the voting demographic as well. So what yeah. was your experience? Yeah, and, and yes, you can tell us about the, you know, the immigration system better than anyone else. Um, honestly, what I saw at the border, you know, I guess it was shocking in the moment, but from what we've been hearing about the crisis at the border, which is all very true, you know, as soon as we got out on the Rio Grande, I was there with the United Cajun Navy out of Louisiana, and we were there in Mission, Texas. And so we were on the Rio Grande. Uh, we get in the water within 10 minutes, we see three rafts going across with about maybe 10 to 12 people uh, and all, you know, guided by coyotes. And so the coyotes, they're wearing masks around their faces. You know, they take their rafts across with the people on it. They don't get off the rafts themselves, but the people do, you know, deboard from the raft and they go up the hill. Um, and the interesting part about this, it's different as we talk to Border Patrol, is because Joe Biden changed the policy, right? It used to be remain in Mexico before you appear before an immigration judge. Uh, because he changed that policy and now they're welcomed into the facilities, they want to be caught by Border Patrol uh, because that means they get into a facility, uh, they can get cleaned up. You know, some people are being tested for COVID, some people are not, uh, you know, but they can get there and, and get food and water and then the journey kind of ends. Uh, they get their appear, you know, immigration uh, papers appear for a judge uh, and then they enter the catch and release program. So that's when they actually are put either on a bus or a plane and then they're dispersed across the country. Uh, but as we know, a lot of people don't then appear, you know, they just kind of go about their lives. Um, and so it's, it's very crazy and, and unfortunate, but I don't know if you saw just yesterday, the state of Arizona uh, has opened up a case against the Biden administration, specifically against the Department of Homeland Security for the uh, National Environment Policy Act. Uh, and basically what they're saying is because there's over 1000 immigrants coming across the border each day, that it's putting a strain on their resources and the environment. So they're saying specifically the schools and the hospitals and get this, the infrastructure, right? As we see Joe Biden pushing a $2.3 trillion infrastructure bill, he's harming the infrastructure right there in Arizona. So they want the border wall to remain, uh, to, to continue being built. And then they want that policy remain in Mexico to go back in effect. Okay. And just as we are finishing up, you were a great candidate in 2020, and a lot of us are hoping you will be a candidate again soon. Can you tell us any secret plans for the future besides Red Renaissance? Are you planning to run again? I know we were uh, chit-chatting with uh, General Flynn, and he kind of said, there's a higher calling for you. Um, what are you going to do? What are you thinking? Yeah, General Flynn and uh, Congressman Trey Gowdy, I know you probably remember him. They're all of like, course. you know, you effectuate more change outside of the halls of Congress. And, and I understand what they mean. Um, you know, if I can get, like I said, if we can help flip this house in, in 22, that'd be amazing. Um, you know, who knows what I'll do, I guess, at this point in time. District 7, even after redistricting, it happens in September, it'll still be a D plus 26 to 30 district. And so we have some people uh, that have been helping us run some numbers on a possible Senate seat here in Maryland. Uh, but at the same time, you know, if I took two years off and, and then try to figure it out for 24, you know, it is what it is. But, at the, you know, for me, it's all about flipping the house right now, uh, whether I'm one of those people or not. Uh, I think even if I ran in District 7, I still would have to continue chipping away. You know, that's not a district that we're going to win overnight. So I really want to focus on actually flipping that house. Uh, so we can, like I said, get back to normalcy. 
as you said, there are five seats to be flipped and you're doing yeah. some incredible things around the country. So thank you for all of that. And thank you for joining us today. I'm sure we're going to see you again and hear some amazing things that you're doing. Yeah, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks. And we'll see you soon in Naples. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. Thank you.